Hello, in this lecture we'll be working a problem about the statement of cash flow. We'll be using the indirect method to work this problem. We'll talk more about what the indirect method is as compared to the direct method as we go through this. We're going to have the information on the left hand side. We're going to enter that information into a worksheet here which will help us to put together the statement of cash flows. Then we'll put together the statement of cash flows and we're going to have a few adjustments to them. A few things we're going to want to learn when we do the statement of cash flows. It's good to do this because one, it helps us to read the statement of cash flows, which is which is good. So creating the statement of cash flows helps us to later read the statement of cash flows. It also has a similar issue in terms of balancing, just like when we have the balance sheet. If it's not in balance, yeah, uh, we might have to go do the whole thing, looking through the whole thing over again to see where it is out of balance. We're going to want to build a structured system in that we can basically try to find check figures along the way so that uh, we can see if we are out of balance where we are out of balance instead of basically waiting till we're at the end of the whole process and then having to uh, do the whole thing over basically to find out why it's not tying out. So we're, we're going to look for systems to put something together in such a way that uh, we can have kind of checks as we go to prevent the, the case where we have to go back and do everything over again. So the statement of cash flows, generally most people will take the statement of cash flows and put a worksheet together that will help them to create the statement of cash flows that's how we'll basically approach this. Now, note that the statement of cash flows is as of a time, a flow time period has a beginning and an end. It's not a point in time, such as the balance sheet, but it has a beginning and an end time frame. And we are, of course, measuring the flow of the cash, how much cash came in, how much cash came out through a certain time frame, usually being a month or a year or something like that. And the funny thing is that we actually measure that using basically the balance sheet oftentimes, and that balance sheet of is of course as of a point in time so what we're going to do in this case is we got the 2000 x5 and the 2000 x4 and we are measuring uh, the difference basically what's going to happen between that time period meaning uh, we're measuring as of the end of the statement will be as of the end of 2000 x5 or measuring the period ended 2000 x5 and we're going to look at the beginning period which is the end of the last financial statement. So 2000 X4 is the end of last year. It's also, of course, the beginning of 2000 X5, same numbers. And we're going to compare where we are at the end of the period, the point in time, the balance sheet, to where we were at the beginning of the period. The change between those two, we're going to assume, is where we start to figure out the flow, what happened, what happened over time, what's the change that happened. So we're going to take this information, we're going to put this into our worksheet, we're going to do some data entry first, uh, this is going to be a bit tedious, but it's worth doing because obviously data entry is something we're going to uh, do often. And this is the first time where we're basically taking the balance sheet and putting it back into pretty much like a trial balance format. So in prior uh, lectures, we've taken a look at uh, putting a trial balance in debit and credit format and then making a financial statement from it. We're basically doing the opposite now. Now we've got a, a plus and minus format in the financial statements just on the balance sheet, though. And we're going to basically put that back in real quickly to a uh, just like a trial balance debit and credit type worksheet. So let's start with that. So we got the cash here. Cash is a debit. We're going to represent debits with positive numbers and credits with negative numbers in this worksheet. That will help us to save some columns. Also help us with some formulas. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, zero in the cash accounts receivable seven, seven, one, zero, zero. The inventory 240600 and the prepaid expense of 151. We have a check figure here being the total current assets. We're not going to put that total current assets. The totals will not go into our worksheet. However, it's a good place for us to add this up and say, are we doing uh, what we should so far? We add up to 456250, 456250. So we're on track so far. The property, plant, and equipment 262250. And the accumulated depreciation, notice if we put in 110750 here and we do our check figure thing, we add these two up, it doesn't check to this check figure. And if we add up all the assets, it doesn't check to the total assets here. Why is that? Because the accumulated depreciation is a contra asset. So people often get mixed up in this area. Just You can see that in this financial statement by the fact that it says less. That means it's a minus problem. Uh, in our case, we're going to say that it's a negative or a credit over here. So we're going to say this is a credit negative. It's a contra asset, meaning it's an asset with a credit balance, unlike other assets that have 
debit balance, so it's contrary to the norm. Then we're going to have our liabilities. Liabilities are credit balance accounts. We're going to represent the credit balance accounts with negative numbers on our worksheet. So the accounts payable, we're going to say is negative 17750. The notes payable, we're going to say is negative 15,000 for a credit. If we add those two up, I'm just going to highlight those two in the task bar. 32750 ties out to the 32750. Then we're going to put down here, we're going to continue on to the 100,000. And then we have total liabilities, which is, of course, the accounts payable down to here. 132,750. We can use our check figure. 132,750 looks correct. We're moving on to equity. Equity also has a credit balance. So we're going to represent the credits with negative numbers in this case. So we're going to say negative 215,000 and additional paid in capital, negative 30,000 and then retained earnings, negative 230. And that should take us in balance, meaning that the debits minus the credits equal zero. Note that that has to work. The debits minus the credits must equal zero. If it doesn't, then what happened is we just probably have the sign going the wrong way on one of these. And all we have to do is just go through our check figures and see that each piece ties out to the uh, subtotals here. And if they do, then it will work. All right, so we're going to take the uh, 2000X form. We're going to do this one more time. I know it's tedious, but I'm just going to do it fairly quickly. And we'll put this through here. So we got the cash 61550. And then the 80750, the 250700 prepaid, oop, one too many zeros, 250700 prepaid expenses, 17000, check the subtotals, we'll highlight those, 140, uh, 410, 410, then we'll do the property, plant, and equipment, 200,000 for equipment, less, meaning contra asset, negative, credit balance, 95,000 for accumulated depreciation, we can check the subtotal of 105, 105, or all of the assets, total assets, 515, 515, looking good so far. Going down to the payables, payables, we've got negative 102. We've got the short-term debt, 10,000 credit. We have a subtotal, we can highlight those two, 112, 112. So we're looking good. We're going down to the next word, long-term, negative 775. And once again, total asset, total liabilities. We can highlight the three liabilities. Task bar adds up 189.5. Looks good so far. Moving down to common stocks. It's common stock. Negative credit balance 200,000. We have additional paid in capital zero. Retained earnings negative 125,500. This should put us in balance like so. So it does do so. If we have our check figure, it has to work. Now the idea here is going to be that if we have something that is in balance, indicated by the debits minus the credits equals zero, and if we have something else that's in balance, then we can take the difference between all these accounts, and we will end up with something that will also be in balance. So we're going to do a subtraction problem here, and we're going to take the difference that change uh, from 2000x5 and 2000x4. So the formula is going to be equals 2000x5 minus 2000x4 equals 2000x5 minus 2000x4 equals 2000x5 minus 2000x4 equals 2000x5 minus 2000x4 and you might be saying there is an easier way to do this and there is and we can use the autofill to continue this formula down so I'm going to do that at this time obviously the formula will be the same it's a relational formula therefore uh, we can use the autofill by putting our cursor on the fill handle so it looks like that Holding down the left click and dragging down. Auto drives it down. Dr. Phil calculates. And there it is. We get uh, the zero subtotal down here. Now, obviously, if we want to see what's happening, we can double click on any cell. And it's still the same thing that is going on. So if we take the difference from each of these items, then it must add up to zero. That change must add up to zero. So now that we have this little worksheet here, what we're going to do is we're going to take that worksheet and we're going to put it into the format of a statement of cash flows. What does a statement of cash flows look like? It's going to have three parts. It's going to have cash flows from operations. And that is going to be the area where um, it's most related to the question of, it is related to the question of whether we have a direct or indirect method. So we're going to be using an indirect method. And the idea here being that 
uh, if we look at the income statement, it's on an accrual basis. So when we think about the income statement, how much revenue and expenses we have, that's how we did over time, but it's on an accrual basis and we, we want to see what the flows are in terms of cash. So uh, we could take the income statement and rename the entire thing, meaning we could rename the, the uh, sales account or the revenue account to be cash received from customers and rename the expense account to be cash paid. But uh, that might take more work in some cases if we already have, that would be the direct method by the way, if we already have the net income number, it could be easier for us to actually take that uh, ending balance number that we've already calculated on the income statement and then back out the things that are not cash and that's going to be the indirect method. Uh, the indirect method is by far the most used method and there's a few reasons for that. One, it might be a little bit easier for the reasons we just stated that we already calculated net income and two, um, many times it's, it's required in a lot of different settings so a lot of times if you do the direct method you still have to do the indirect method. I personally do like the direct method because uh, I think it presents the, the information in a way that more people more readily understand because it just represents the information in, in, uh, in terms of a cash flow <laughs> on an income statement. But uh, the indirect method is, is by far the most used, so therefore we're going to take a look at the indirect method. So we're going to start with net income and then back everything out from there in the indirect method. Uh, we also have, however, cash flows that are not on the income statement. They're not basically income statement type things. They're things that, uh, such as cash flows from investing activities. So if we purchase like a truck or a large piece of equipment, a building, then that wouldn't be on the income statement, even though there's cash flow. So we're going to record the cash flow, but we're going to put it down here into an investing activities. And then we've got cash flow from financing activities. And once again, those are going to be things that cash went in and out. We paid or received loans or something like that. Dividends and whatnot will go into this section. Now, the idea here is going to be that we want to find a home for all of these numbers. Once we find a home for all of these numbers, we will be in balance. I, in this case, we're showing we're in balance by this zero down here. In the statement of cash flows, what's going to happen is we're going to find a home for all numbers except cash, right? And if we find a home for all numbers except cash, what will be the difference? It will be the change in cash, 61.9, 61, 61.9. 61, so this 61.9 is going to be at the end of the cash flow statement. That's going to be the increase right there. So that's what we're going to end up with. We're going to find a home for everything else, which will leave us with the change in cash. Um, also want to note that we are first just going to find a home for the numbers listed here in this type of format that I'm showing you. Uh, we will then later have to go back in and break some of these changes out into smaller components, into components of these numbers. I would suggest that we first find a home for all of these numbers and then recognize that we're going to have to go back and find a home for uh, or fix some of those numbers or break them out into the components. The reason for this is because this will help us to basically be in balance and then do the changes in such a way that we can not have a problem and, and end up once again being at the end of the process and not knowing where we went out of balance. So if we find a home for all these numbers before we start breaking them up into a bunch of different numbers, then we can say, okay, we're in balance. Now let's adjust what needs to be adjusted. And if something gets out of whack, we have a, a we know where it went out of whack and that's with the adjusting process. So in order to do that, we're going to, we're going to basically just go through this list of accounts, but we're really going to start with net income because that's going to be the start of the cash flows from operations. And again, most of you are going to be really tempted to say, well, let's go look at the income statement. That's, that's where net income is. And you're right, but I'm going to start with net income as the change. How can we think of what net income is as far as the change in the balance sheet? And oftentimes this is like the most confusing question <laughs> to start off with, but the answer to that is in uh, retained earnings. So the change in retained earnings is in part going to be net income. So, the, and that's because basically we closed out net income to retained earnings in the closing process. So retained earnings, part of that change, the big part, most of it is net income. Now, you, so we're going to use that 104. And in order to bring that 104 up here, I'm going to put a negative and point to this 104. 
and enter. So I'm going to flip the sign. I'm, I'm going to do that with all of these accounts just to make the worksheet work. Uh, that's just how the worksheet's going to work. Don't worry about this side over here. That's going to be when we adjust the information. The first thing you're going to probably say is, well, you know, we have...